next? Because it, it's a very wide subject. It can't be covered in one time. So we get an overview tonight. And then if we want to go on with it, we'll get into the, the books of the Bible that describe it. There isn't much else to go on except that. And here are my notes. The other Jewish rebellion and the times of the Maccabees and a uh, guiding light in this particular study is a great little book, Harrington, The Maccabean Revolt, The Anatomy of a Biblical Revolution. And I'm gonna cover pages 89 and following along with my own material here. So to begin the overview, let's have a word of prayer. Father, <laughs> the Maccabees were heroes of their time, but they were also violent men. We pray that the zeal that Mattathias called for in his people, we might call for today, but a zeal that overcomes the enemy without the need of guns, without the need of arrows, without EMPs or bombs or nuclear reactions. Help us through the power of our word and your spirit to overcome our enemy. That is the enemy that has overcome creation all these years. And let us be the ones who are revealed to help heal the groaning creation. We pray in Yeshua's name, amen. Let me play first for you a Maccabean song, one that comes from ancient times, actually, that Jews still sing today. And we sing if we have a copy of the Elohims. It's called Mats Mats Sir. And it is translated as a rock of ages, but it's a little different rock of ages than we are normally thinking of. Can you hear that? Say yes or no, somebody, please very broken okay it'll be okay this time I tried to set that to the music that I thought was most appropriate for that age. 
And that's the Meatzer. It's a battle song. It's a song to try to get people up and roused and zealous, zealous for what they believe, zealous for what they're going to do, uh, no longer frightened, but vigilant and strong. I'll take a show you the map here just a minute of where we are. Here we go. Here's a map of the Middle East in the times of the Maccabees. When Alexander the Great died uh, choking on a piece of pork, the empire disintegrated into a 40 year period of war and chaos in 321 BC. The Hellenistic world eventually settled into four stable power blocks the four of uh, Alexander's best generals, the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, you can see it right here. The Seleucid Empire in the east, that's the green, huge, and it goes way down here through India. And then there's two other ones we don't hear too much about when we're studying the Bible the kingdom of Pergamum in Asia Minor, and Macedon. Macedon is, let me see, up here. And Pergamum, or they also call it Hellas, Greece, is the Grecian islands here, along with Thrace, or Thrace. So those are the four kingdoms from, that came from Alexander. Now, where's Israel? Israel, Jerusalem, right here. At the particular time they made this map, it was part of the Ptolemaic heritage, inheritance. But actually, most of this time, it, it was not part of the Ptolemaic, nor part of the Seleucid, but it was there as an independent little kingdom all by itself, in between two powers that hated each other. So all through the time of past Alexander and on, it was being fought for back and forth between these two, between the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires, and they went back and forth into the hands of each. And so now, we are to a place where the Hellenists come through. They bring their armies through to attack the Ptolemaic kingdom. And on the way back home, they come in through Jerusalem and rob the temple. And then go on back home. And they didn't think they got enough of that. So they came back around, robbed the temple again and went home. And I think that's probably the thing that set the whole Maccabean rebellion off, but we'll see here. 171 to 151 BC. Remember, we're, we've got to think of those dates as backward. 171 is earlier than 151. Who? The Maccabee or Hasmonean brothers, the Jewish high priesthood, and the kings of Seleucia. Why? I think the double invasion of the Jewish temple is the main reason. And our sources are the book of Daniel first, then the books of second Maccabees, and then first Maccabees in that order. The book of Daniel tells an awful lot about the Maccabean revolt in terms of prophecy. And we'll discuss apocalyptic literature here in a minute. Daniel is an apocalypse. Second and first Maccabees, they're pretty clearly history, but not the type of history that we're used to. Not a secular history. At that time, religion was bound up completely in realistic life, in nation, national politics. Religion and politics were one. 
And as I said, the chronological sources of information, Daniel first, second Maccabees second, first Maccabees later. So uh, if you want to continue on, if you like this, then you probably want to start reading through those books in the next week or so. We'll hit on Daniel uh, next time. We're going to show you what many of these symbols in Daniel actually refer to in the expressing in a cryptic way what was going on at the time of the writer of Daniel. And that order provides a 40 year spread of events, each source viewing from a different perspective. No other primary sources really exist, at least not from the period contemporaneous with the actual events. Josephus talks a lot about it, of course, but still that was 400 years or more after the events happened. Bible books regarding the Maccabees in chronological order. Daniel is a story of the arrogance of the little horn. That little horn, as you recall, is eventually broken by the coming of Elohim's kingdom. A mountain falls on the little horn. Then second, second Maccabees is... Uh, regards the war as El's care of the temple and use of Yehuda the Maccabee or Yehuda Hasman as a divine instrument. So Yehuda or Judas is featured in 2 Maccabees. 1 Maccabees, the entire historical period is dominated by the Maccabees from beginning to end. No ancient sources are free from personal bias. And you might know that there is a third Maccabees and a fourth Maccabees. The third has nothing to do with the time of the Maccabees. It has to do with a, a different time in Ptolemais or in the, uh, uh, the Ptolemaic empire or kingdom. And you might remember that's the one that has the 500 drunken elephants in it. What a great story. So perhaps we'll even get to that later. So the perspective of each source, the first Maccabees tells us that the rebellion began at Modin, just west of Jerusalem, about a day's walk. We look at 1 Maccabees 2.15. Then the king's officers who were enforcing the apostasy came to the city of Modin to make them offer sacrifice. The king here is, of course, the king of the Seleucid Empire. Many from Israel came to them, and Mattathias, that was the father of five sons, were assembled. And the king's officer spoke to Mattathias as follows. You are a leader, honored and great in this city and supported by sons and brothers. Now, you be the first to come and do what the king commands, as all the Gentiles and the men of Yehuda and those that are left in Jerusalem have done. Then you and your sons will be numbered among the friends of the king. And you and your sons will be honored with silver and gold and many gifts. And one of the cool gifts here is spoken of in 2 Maccabees 4.12. He took delight in establishing a gymnasium right under the citadel. And he induced the nobles of the, of the young men to wear the Greek hat. Cool. When I first read that, I thought that is the silliest thing I ever understood. except. Now we've got MAGA hats, Make America Great Again hats that cause rebellion everywhere they go. But the Greek hat was the hat of the god Hermes. And uh, here's one version of it. This is what I found mostly. This thing with wings on it. And here's another Greek hat here that comes from an earlier time. That kind of looks like a ball cap, doesn't it? 
or uh, what do they call it? An old fogey's hat. Mm -hmm. How would you like to be wearing the hat with the wings on it? Wouldn't that be a great inducement for the nobles to come over? But what uh, the author says here is that Many of the Jews even came into the understanding, religion, culture of the Greeks and consider that Alexander the Great conquered that area or about 300 BC. And by the time of the first century, they had been under Greek rule for three, 400 years. That's why I can tell you for sure that a lot of Jews in the first century didn't even speak Aramaic. They didn't even speak Hebrew. Well, Hebrew, they only spoke that in the temple anyway, because that was the pure language. They didn't speak that out among the masses. That's why when Yahshua brings disciples in, it's interesting to note that some of those disciples had Hebrew names, and some of them, like Philippos, had Greek names. So that kind of dichotomizes that some of those guys were still among the Jews, so to speak, and some of them were among the Greeks. And you remember one time, Philip comes up to Yahshua and he says, look, these Greek guys want to speak to you. And Yahshua would pay no attention to them whatsoever. So there was a real divide, especially in Galilee, where at least one third of the people in Galilee were foreigners that spoke Greek. And the country people continued to speak Western Aramaic. But Mattathias answered and said in a loud voice, even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him and have chosen to do his commandments, departing each one from the religion of his fathers, yet I and my sons and my brothers will live by the covenant of our fathers. Far be it from us to desert the Torah and the ordinances. We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. This is almost a contemporary issue right now. We've got people say, I am not going to be conquered by that mandate, no matter if it kills me. And when he had finished speaking these words, a Jew came forward in the sight of all to sacrifice upon the altar of Modian, according to the king's command. When Mattathias saw it, he burned with zeal, and his heart was stirred, and he gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him upon the altar. At the same time, he killed the king's officer who was forcing them to sacrifice, and he tore down the altar. Thus he burned with zeal for the Torah, as Phineas did against Zimri, the son of Saulu. You might remember that story. Uh, Phineas is full of zeal, and the priests there had all apostatized and married women from a, another country and different religions, and they had in the temple priests who were married to pagans, and they were trying to understand what to do with them, and here comes Phineas, who, or Pinkas, who probably did something we wouldn't want to do today. But uh, it was not only considered a zeal, but Yahweh said, you'll always have someone before me. And he, he considered Pincus or Phineas a priest after the order of Phineas. He started the priesthood. In the first century, the rebels considered themselves, no matter who they were, priests of the order of Phineas. Then Matthias cried, cried out in the city with a loud voice, saying, Let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. 
and he and his sons fled to the hills and left all that they had in the city. I'm dry mouthed. And if you're listening, could you please bring me a glass of cold water? Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Second Maccabees. That book attributes the action to the Maccabee Judah. Second Maccabees 5:27 or 8, 1 through 7. But Yehuda, Judah, who was called Maccabeus, that means hammer, Jude the hammer, and his companions secretly entered the villages and summoned their kinsmen and enlisted those who had con continued in the Jewish faith. And so they gathered about 6,000 men and they besought Yahweh to look upon the people who were oppressed by all and have pity on the temple, which had been profaned by unholy, unelohimly men, and to have mercy on the city, which was being destroyed and about to be leveled to the ground, and to hearken to the blood that cried out to him, and to remember also the lawless destruction of the innocent babies and the blasphemies committed against his name, and to show his hatred of evil. As soon as Maccabeus got his army organized, the Gentiles could not withstand him, for the wrath of Yahweh had turned to mercy. Coming without warning, he was set fire to towns and villages. He captured strategic positions and put to flight not a few of the enemy. He found the knights most advantageous for such attacks, and talk of his valor spread everywhere. Thank you very much. So that's the gist of, sec of Second Maccabees. It's all about Yehuda. And you might remember how Yehuda Maccabee, the hammer, lost his first army. The Seleucids, which we will heretofore call Greeks, because they were the same, they attacked their camp in the mountains on the Sabbath, killed everyone. The Maccabee brothers got away. However, Judah Maccabee called for a new direction, and that was that from now on, we're not going to simply rest on the Shabbat because on the Shabbat, we must do the work of Elohim. And that is to fight these heathens, else we'll lose everything. So we had to raise another army. The book of Daniel is all about the Maccabean times, except they dismiss, dismiss the revolt by calling it a little help. Daniel 11.34. He, speaking of the little horn in Daniel 11, 32, that little horn being the king Antiochus Epiphanes, shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, and the people who know their Elohim shall stand firm and take action. And those among the people who are wise shall make many understand, though they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. For some days, when they fall, they shall receive a little help. Now, Daniel is not prophecy of the future. You can dispute me on this, but don't hate me because I don't believe that it is. It's an apocalypse. It's an apocalypse of the present, just as parts of Revelation, Zechariah, 4th Ezra, 2nd Baruch, and some of Paul's writings, some of the gospel writings, as well as the shepherd of Hermas are. They're not describing future happenings, but contemporaneous events as they unfold, written in cryptic, prophetic style, with the intention of telling the news of Jerusalem to all Jewry, Jewry, in a manner that couldn't be understood by the enemy. 
no matter who the enemy happened to be. A tip-off as to whether a text is prophecy or apocalypse, well, prophecy always begins with thus saith Yahweh. Apocalypse always has an angelic mediator or tour guide. All those books that I just spoke of have at least part apocalypsis in, in them, and there's always an angelic mediator. There's no intermediary for prophecy except the prophet. The prophet is plugged in to heaven for the word. <clears throat> So when I say this, I don't say it without having also studied through these books and learned the history of these times and made up my mind that the writings in the apocalyptic se sections do indeed follow the history of those times as we know it. So all military action on behalf of the Maccabees takes place against the kings of the Seleucids. So we need to get acquainted with the place and the players. Note that though the war was won by the Maccabees against the kings of the Seleucid Empire with the help of Sparta and Rome, the nation was given back through the corruption of the Maccabees. Like the one who wins the lottery and ends up hopeless, homeless. That's the Maccabean story. They win the lottery and they end up homeless. We'll see why later. We should consider that Elohim was in this as when the Maccabees were on top, instead of following the order of Elohim and putting a priest from the house of Zadok back in, they usurped the priesthood for themselves. We read who was to have the priesthood forever and ever in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 40 through 44, and that was the house of Zadok, including the calendar. But when they get to the point where they can replace a high priest, they put themselves in. In fact, Jonathan Maccabee put himself in not only as high priest, but also as king and as general of the army. He took a, a, a threefold part in the kingdom. And in doing so, he went against the word of Elohim concerning the priesthood. And so he ended up in worse shape than before. Now let's look at some illustrations. We took a look at the map. Trying to go fast here. I wanted to show you where Modian is. Here's Jerusalem. Looks like a long ways away, but it's not. It's only about a day's walk. But they settled there in Modian, but then they had to leave Modin, uh, Jerusalem also, and settle back in Gazara because they had people there that could protect them, that is the Maccabean family. So for the time being, they went back outside of where all the fighting was, and it's in this shaded area where all the fighting was. The kings that we come become familiar with through reading uh, the three books, Seleucus III, Seranus, or Soter, which means savior. 225 to 223, I pick him out because he's the head of this dynasty. The dynasty that were so greedy for Judea. Here's Antiochus III, the great, on a coin the brother of Seleucus III. Now you get the idea where uh, the, the empire was called the Seleucus Empire. From a brother-sister marriage, 
Seleucus IV, Philopater, which Philopater means father loving. These were all evil men. Here's the little horn. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. Epiphanes is Greek. It kind of means God manifest. It really means something like a manifestation, uh, like a phantasm. But the phantasm that they speak of here was that God was manifest in him. He lived 175 to 163 BC. Then we have Antiochus V, Jupiter, a swell father. You means well or good. Pator means father. He was a swell father. Demetrius, Soter, savior. Alexander, Balas which means light. And Demetrius II, Nicator, which means victor, or actually it can mean people beater, like Nicodemus means people beater. Nica, Nica, whenever you see that, it means victor or beater of something. So in the Maccabean stories, Really, from here on down, the little horn on down, those are all involved and are mentioned in the, the story. Next, we have the family of the Maccabees. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Might be able to get it to 200. Okay. The father of Mattathias was Hosman, H A S M O N. That's why they call this family the Hasmonians, because of the grandpa, Mattathias, that slew the Greek envoy at Modian. He's the father. Here are the sons, John Gotti. That sounds like the name of a gangster, doesn't it? John Gotti? He dies in 160 BC. I think that the cleansing of the temple was in 165 BC. So he lived uh, another five years and was undoubtedly killed in the war. Simon is a second son, Simon the ha Hammer. He also be became, through his own proclamation, the high priest. And this is when he served, 142 to 135. He's probably a pretty old guy by then. Yehuda Maccabeus, he's the one that Second Maccabees likes to talk about. I don't think he made himself high priest. But they say he did. He died also in 160, so he kind of correlates with Gadi, and we know that he died in battle. But he was the main hammer. He was the strategist for the whole thing. And he was a righteous man. Then there's Eliezer, died in 162. After Judas Maccabeus died in war, Eliezer also died in war, but he died in the strangest way. He was in the battle line, and yonder came the Seleucid army, and he thought that 
Antiochus Epiphanes was riding an elephant. There were lots of elephants out there, but he thought he saw the king on an elephant. He broke ranks with his spears and he ran right straight across toward the enemy army and he slew that elephant. His hope was to, when the king fell off, he was going to slay the king. Then the battle was over. The war was over. However, the elephant fell on him and killed him. Imagine that. He runs out in an act of bravery and he is killed by an elephant. Then there's Jonathan, probably the most notorious of them as high priest. He actually, he's the one that took the threefold crown and practically sold the entire place back to the Greeks again. Now we have a number of puppet rulers through the rest of the Maccabees that we don't really need to talk about, but they're, they're spoken of in symbolic language in the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially John Hyrcanus. Yeah, the, these are too much to get into right now, but it's a really interesting story. You just have to read it from Josephus because we don't have any more in the Bible. And here is a little piece of old art. I think right there's Eliezer. He stuck the elephant in the chest. And that elephant is as big as a tower. And the elephant comes tumbling down and that's the end of him. Wasn't that exciting? Illustrations. Okay, here we are. <clears throat> There were three wicked priests mentioned. There's a wicked priest mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls and certainly in the books we are having to do with. And this is another perspective on the entire war. The last Zadokite priest, Onia, sound familiar? Onia the third. In 176, he was cast out of the priesthood by jealous other priests that became known as Sadducees. Zadokites and Sadducees is the same word. It's used in different ways. Onia was the last of the Zadokites. He was murdered in 171 by the Sadducees. His son, Onia the fourth, was able to continue true worship on for another, another 250 years. Of course, he didn't live that long, but he went to Egypt and asked the king of Egypt, um, Ptolemy Philopater, if he couldn't bring his group in to Egypt and build a temple. Wouldn't Ptolemy help him build a temple unto Yahweh? And Ptolemy said, yes. And we can read about that a little bit in prophetic sense in Isaiah 19, where it talks about the city of the sun, because the place that Ptolemy gave Onia the fourth to build that new temple of Yahweh was called Heliopolis. And Heliopolis means the city of the sun. Prophesied very much like what really happened at the end 
of Isaiah 19, take a look sometime. I might say that instead of a menorah in the temple, they call it the Onion Temple in Egypt, lots and lots of Jews were in Egypt. And they didn't necessarily follow the Judaism of Jerusalem. You'll read in 2 Maccabees, there was a great big split between Jerusalem and Heliopolis. The menorah was replaced in the, in the Onion Temple in Egypt at Heliopolis with a large golden disc. And so we're thinking quite probably there was a connection there between the type of worship of Yahweh that they did in Egypt connected to that which Akhenaten brought in. Because when they compare the services of Akhenaten and later those of the Onion Temple, they're very similar. In fact, among the ruins of Akhenaten's palace, they found Psalm 104, the creation psalm, written upon a wall that had been torn apart. I think 8,000 bricks had been taken apart. And when that was all put back together, it formed something so similar to the 104th Psalm only a thousand years earlier that one had to be taken from the other. So, um, I'm thinking that probably most of Akhenaten's uh, fellowship there were Jews in the exile of Egypt. So there's the story of Onias the third and fourth. <clears throat> that was also the time when the Zadokites had to get out. They were exiled. They went to Egypt and they also went in the wilderness of Syria. And stayed themselves in wilderness camps which you read about in the scrolls it's just incredible what knowledge the dead sea scrolls have brought in then following onias the third three hellenists who acquired the priesthood by bidding they bought the priesthood these were not of the families that elohim had approved from the high priesthood and they may not have even been Jews. The first was Jason, who was a Jew. He came in as a reformer. He was there for three years, seeking to bring more people in by discouraging circumcision and food ordinances. He tried to modify or modernize the religion, uh, very similar to what Paul did later. When Paul goes into Europe, he discourages circumcision and the food ordinances and a few other things from the Torah, primarily, I believe, because they were against Roman law in Europe. If he had done those things as a foreign religion coming in, he was not considered a Jew by the Romans. He would have had not only to go to prison, but he would have, he would have been circumcised himself for that. Only his head would have been circumcised. So this is what Jason did, try to modify and add Greek customs. He allowed the baths, the gymnasium. These were appalling to the old liner Jews. Why? Because the baths and the gymnasium were done um, naked by both men and women. Jason didn't last long. But he was influential because once those Greek accoutrements got in there, they stayed in there. The next was Menelaus, who outright bought the priesthood. Menelaus was there for, look, um, 11 years. He was a temple robber. He stole from the temple. And he was an outright traitor to Israel. But he remained 11 years. and, and practically destroyed any wealth that Israel had left. After him is the person I think is the wicked priest, 
from the scrolls, Alchemus, or you might pronounce it Alcimus. In these languages, the C before a vowel still sounds like K, Alchemus. 163 to 159, let's see, seven, six, four years, right? He was from an Aaronic family. He received this by popular vote, but he was very cruel, arrested and executing the leaders of the Hasidians. He's the one that executed the Essenes. When you read Hasidians in the Maccabees, think Enochians or Essenes, same thing. These are not the Hasidians of modern days. This is a whole different group. They were the holy ones, the pious ones. And you can see the relationship to Hasid and Essene in the very sound of the word. And he called in Greek troops, caused two battles, and that last battle took the life of Yehuda ben Hasmon. Any one of these three could be called wicked priest but probably Alchemus. That is, if the scrolls were written at this time, and nobody knows if they were for sure. I probably lean toward first century AD because uh, too many of the scrolls fit in gosh, almost perfectly with the, with the situation of Paul and James and the chief priests and the Romans at that time. It's a perfect fit with the first century. But we don't know enough about this to know whether it's fitting this or not, but they like to keep the scrolls as far away from New Testament times as they possibly can. But not all Jewish groups were Maccabees, and not all groups follow the Maccabees. There are other parties as well. There were the Hasidians, who at this time gave up on the Maccabees, after all, they were exiled, and the Maccabees were part of the slaughter of Alchemus. Um, Sixty were brought out of the Essenes as an example and were murdered before the people. Why were they lawbreakers? No, just as an example. That caused all of them to move out. Those that followed Onias the Fourth, they went to Egypt. Those that followed the teacher of righteousness went to Syria. The party of the Enochians, the party of the Sabbath observers, the party of Menelaus, the party of Jason, the party of the Zadokites, the party of Alchemus, and the Gentile party as well. Whether they did or did not follow the Maccabean ways, probably you can tell by the very names of the groups. There are other ways to gauge the length of the Maccabean revolt. One of those is the survival of the Acre Citadel. This citadel in Jerusalem near the temple was founded by the Seleucids in 166 BC to hold troops of armies so they could keep control of Jerusalem. But when the Maccabees got the Seleucids out of Jerusalem in the area, those troops were still holed up in this citadel. And if you can count the number of years between 166 and 141, that's how many years they were held up in there. They were, these were manned by the enemy the entire time. Of course, the Seleucids were able to come in. Antiochus Epiphanes did come in a couple of times during that time, maybe refresh that group. 
Consider Jerusalem free from external enemies, yet over near the temple stands a compound full of soldiers for the enemy, and some of them Jewish. It reminds us of the Antonian citadel in the times of the, the revolt in 70 AD. They had something uh, just almost exactly like they had a high, high tower full of Roman soldiers and to control the Jews, they kept the vestments of the priests in there. If it was time to do the daily sacrifices, they the priests had to come over there, check those vestments out, put them on, go over and do their job, come back and check them back in. And what did they do that four or five times a day? That was a good way to control the religion and see that nothing was going wrong at, during that time. Oh, I'm on time here. Maccabees 1, 13, 49 and following. The men of the citadel in the citadel of Jerusalem were, pre were prevented from going out to the country and back to buy and sell. So they were very hungry. I guess so after 10 or 15 years. Many of them died of hunger. Then they cried to Simon to make peace with them. And he did so, but he expelled them from there and cleansed the citadel from its pollutions. On the 23rd day of the second month in the 171st year, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments and with hymns and songs because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from the city. And Simon decreed that every year they should celebrate this day with rejoicing. He strengthened the fortifications of the Temple Hill along the citadel, and he and his men dwelt there. And Simon saw that John, his son, had reached manhood, so he made him commander of all the forces, and he dwelt in Gazara with whatever was left of the family. Yet revolutions sowed the seeds of their own destruction. Remember that the Maccabees called the Romans in to help them. They also called the Spartans in. You know, they think that the Jews, or the Hebrews, I should say, and the Spartans were related. That the Spartans were, back in primordial ages, the Jews and the Spartans were together. Some of them left off there in Sparta. Some went on to Egypt. So what happens here is found in 1 Maccabees 8, 17. So Judas chose Eupolemus, the son of John, son of Akos, the, and Jason, the son of Eliezer. That's probably the guy that the, that the elephant fell on. And sent them to Rome to establish friendship and alliance and to free themselves from the yoke. For they saw that the kingdom of the Greeks was completely enslaving Israel, and they went to Rome, a very long journey, and they entered the Senate chamber and spoke as follows. Yehuda, who is called Maccabeus, and his brothers and the people of the Jews have sent us to you to establish alliance and peace with you, that we may enroll as your allies and friends. The proposal pleased them, and this is a copy of the letter that they wrote in reply on bronze tablets and sent to Jerusalem to remain with them there as a memorial of peace and alliance. Here's the actual letter. May all go well with the Romans and with the nation of the Jews at sea and on land forever, and may sword and enemy be far from them. If war comes first to Rome or any of their allies in all their dominion, the nation of the Jews shall act as their allies wholeheartedly as the occasion may indicate to them. And so to the enemy who makes war, they shall not give any supply of grain, arms, money, ships, as Rome has decided. 
and they shall keep their obligations without receiving any return. In the same way, if war comes first to the nation of the Jews, the Romans shall willingly act as their allies, as the occasion may indicate to them. And the enemy allies shall be given no grains, arms, monies, or ships as Rome has decided. And they shall keep these obligations and do so without deceit. Thus, on these terms, the Romans make a treaty with the Jewish people. If after these terms are in effect, both parties shall determine to add or delete anything, they shall do so at their discretion. And any addition or deletion that they may make shall be valid. And concerning the wrongs which King Demetrius, that was one of the successors of Antiochus, is doing to them, we have written to him as follows. Why have you made your yoke heavy upon our friends and allies, the Jews? If now they appeal again for help against you, we will defend their rights and fight you on sea and land. Now, we don't know if the Romans came in during the course of the revolt of the Maccabees, except for one thing. In, well, first of all, this letter, but the other thing is in Daniel where the Rome, Romans are mentioned in the figure of one of the beasts. So we're thinking that the Romans came in to, to some extent to help the Maccabees in their fight over that 40 years, but their treaty fell back on them because in 63 BC, General Pompey invaded and took over Jerusalem, which eventually led to another great revolt in 66 AD that utterly destroyed Israel. So um, Israel became a client of Rome and in 63 BC, it wasn't just a client, it became a possession of Rome when Pompey came in to Jerusalem and destroyed everything and robbed the temple. That goes back to Roman history. Now, as far as that citadel goes, look what I found. You probably don't want to look up the link, but I'm going to see if I can find this myself right now. Maccabees. Okay, let me change out the share. And this will end up the session. Looky here. 2,000 year old fortress on earth in Jerusalem after century long search. They never did find this citadel of the Greeks. Here's the ruins of it. Here's a little fella here that's going to show us the scale of the whole thing, what little bit they show. Well, that looks like a pretty big ruin there. Uh, that surprising they hadn't found that before now. It's called the Accra Citadel and Tower in the city of David in Jerusalem. Yeah, they're doing, it last five, six years, 10 years, they've been doing a lot of excavation down there. In what archeologists are describing as a solution to one of the greatest archeological riddles in the history of Jerusalem, researchers with the Israel Antiquity Authority announced Tuesday that they have found the remnants of a fortress used by the Seleucid Greek king, Antiochus Epiphanes in his siege of Jerusalem in 168 BC. Now, you probably don't want to hear all this, but there are some other illustrations. Arrowheads, look, they're inscribed. I want to, want to take a look at those a little closer.
Arrowheads found, here's a bigger picture of the Citadel. It was a big place and tower. And how long did I say those guys lived in there? 40 years or something? More arrowheads. Those are ratchet. In the Jewish revolt in 70 AD, General Vespasian got one of these things in his ankle. You wonder how that could even heal up in those days. Well, like if that's 15 inches or is that centimeters? That's centimeters. Those were big. Here are some volunteers. Have you ever wanted to go on an archaeological dig? So that was found, and that was in 15, I believe. Yeah, Times of Israel in 2015. So that hasn't been that long ago, six years ago, that they unearthed that. All right, any questions or comments? Okay, I guess I've stuttered around enough. If you want to try this again, Tuesday we're going to do the book of Daniel. And I will interpret that from a historical perspective. Don't I look like the Wizard of Oz here just ahead with black in the background? Hey, uh, we'll interpret that from a historical perspective. As I said, that's an apocalypse. And I'll show you why it is and why it doesn't have anything to do with the future, except if somebody wants to interpret it that way or if somebody wants to believe it that way, that's fine. But you know, I've heard interpretations now for my entire life, almost, almost 70 years old. I've been at this since I was a kid, since I was a young child and learning about prophecy and hearing evangelists and so forth. And their story changes every five years. You know, they say, well, this is how it's going to happen in the future. It never does. It never will. Do you know why? We'll take Revelation, for example. Everything in Revelation would have to happen exactly like it's told in seven years. Ain't going to happen. But if it does, and everything that Revelation says is going to happen, happens in seven years, sure, I'll believe it. However, when we can look, if we, when we can read Revelation and the Jewish war by Josephus side by side, it becomes very clear that just that Revelation is the same type of cryptic language as Daniel was. Revelation is trying to tell Jews outside of the area, and there were lots of them, hundreds of thousands of them, probably more than there are today, outside of the area in a language only they could understand what was going on in Jerusalem. Now look, why didn't he just write out a history? Because he tried to write out a history while he's working for the Romans out on Patmos. They would ship out his crazy stories. They weren't going to ship anything like that out. The history, he would be executed. I guess that's how he lived so long. Thank you for coming. Yahweh bless you, keep you too. We'll see you on Shabbat next, and then maybe again Tuesday night. Sleep well.